talking to uh, the president and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell. Jane. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and thank you for the work you have do, you do every day, but particularly yesterday. Um, yesterday was a very tough day for the nation, a uh, tough day for the Historical Society. And we thought to open this, se this seminar that we would share with you the statement that we issued yesterday afternoon uh, at 322. And we said at that time, the United States Capitol Historical Society is shocked and heartbroken by today's violent disregard for American values and our constitution. The US Capitol is more than a building. It is the embodiment of American democracy and our way of life. We are a nation of laws and the peaceful transfer of power is among the most fundamental hallmarks of our constitutional republic. Those who enable the malicious forces opposed to these principles betray the foundation upon which they stand. Our system has been tested before by those who are willing to suppress the will of the majority, but democracy is stronger than terror. And now it is time for every citizen to stand up and move to respect the will of the people as demonstrated in their vote. So we issued that statement. Um, we've answered a lot of questions about the history of when, when was the last time the Capitol was breached by a malicious group of people. The answer to that is 1814 by the British during the War of 1812. Um, and we'll get into those kind of things in the conversation with Professor Black. We had originally planned for this session to have Dr. Black talk about his most recent book, which is called Schoolhouse Burning. Um, he's gonna come back and talk about that because we had in this series that we're doing to, toward a more perfect union, we're talking about how the founders of this country set forth a set of values that interestingly, even though the founders were all men, all white guys, property owners, some of the people owned people as property, even still, they had created a document and values that talked about equality and justice. And it has been an ongoing struggle to meet those values. Professor Derek Black, who is our guest today, agreed to change his topic from talking about education as a civil right and his book to talk about the rule of law and what happened yesterday in the context of legal scholarship and historical perspective. Derek Black is a professor of law at the University of South Carolina. His areas of expertise include education law and policy, constitutional law, civil rights, evidence, and torts. Prior to teaching, he litigated issues related to school desegregation, diversity, school finance equity, student discipline, and special education at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. He left the Lawyers Committee to teach at Howard University School of Law where he founded the Education Rights Center. He also taught at the Un University of North Carolina School of Law and American University. He has also been a pro bono counsel in many civil rights cases, a consultant to civil rights campaigns, and was a member of the Obama-Biden presidential transition team. So we are honored to have Professor Black here with us today to talk about what did we learn about our democracy yesterday? And where do we go from here uh, with some historical perspective? As Sam identified, if you have questions, you may put them in the, in the Q&A box. I will curate those questions to Professor Black. We, he and I have talked about, um, we've got a set of questions to start the conversation. So we're gonna start with those and then we'll get the audience engaged. So welcome, Derek Black. We're honored to have you with us. We can't hear you. I said thanks so much to you, Jane and, and Samuel, for putting this together. And uh, you know, 
thank goodness everyone there is, is safe and I'm, I'm sure it was an emotional time for for all of you and, and just as easily could have could have hunkered down so you know a lot of a lot of thanks to you for pressing forward in this important moment and you know before we get to the questions i'll just give one or two quick remarks and and one is you know as a constitutional law professor and i, I taught my first class of the semester in constitutional law this morning to my students and i said this is quite an auspicious morning uh, to teach you constitutional law, but, but not a more important morning than this. Because what yesterday reminded me of is that although we may carry constitutions around in our pockets, or at least some of us professors may, and we may have beautiful buildings that, that represent those constitutions in our systems, that America is an idea. And that idea is only as strong as the people uh, who believe in it. And my charge to them was to, to keep faith in that idea. And it's incumbent upon us all uh, to, to hold those values in our hearts and minds. And when, when we don't, when we lose that, or we cannot convince others of the justness of our ideas, that, that idea ceases to exist. And so that is ultimately a conversation and an education uh, piece, and, and that's what we're here to do today. And so I'm, I'm so excited to be part of it. And thanks, thanks again, Jane and, and Sam, for, for including me in it. Well, Professor Black, we're honored to have you. We're really honored to have you with your distinguished background. Tell us, you have done a lot of research about what did the founders intend when they structured the Constitution? Did the founders ever envision this type of activity that happened yesterday? They were worried about it. Uh, there was no doubt that they, that they were worried about it, that ultimately, you know, you, you're in a world in which public education doesn't exist in any meaningful sense, uh, or at least in any widespread sense. And you have a, you have a, uh, a country that had been ruled by a king, and, and even if we're looking at the folks that seized power, they were, they were, they were elites, right? The sort of the Washingtons and Jeffersons. And so the idea was, you know, we're going to turn this thing over to the people through a constitution. And the fear was that that document, that, that system of government, would be no better than any other if the citizens weren't sufficiently educated to exercise that power, that they could be diluted by hucksters. Um, you know, at, at that moment in time, you know, there certainly was voting going on. I mean, there were people that would hand out bread and, and beer while folks were standing in, in line for votes, right? So it's not as though it was a perfect system uh, at that moment. And so the idea was we have to have an educated voter and, and not educated in just a general sense. When they talked about education and the reason for it, what they really focused on was the ability to find the common good, right? That ultimately, all the people in America have different interests, right? Those folks that, that, that stormed and terrorized the, the Capitol building yesterday and, of course, all this. We, we all have different walks and views in life, and we're not going to eliminate other folks' uh, views of the world, but what we hope we can do through education is help people with disparate interests understand that there is a common good around which we must all come. And so that was the founding idea, right? That if we're gonna have all these disparate people coming together, they have to have the capacity to find the common good. And if they don't, the system will devolve into mob rule. I mean, that was sort of the literal feel, fear was mob rule. And, and we saw at least a glimpse of that, of that mob rule yesterday, not at the ballot box, <laughs> but, um, but obviously with violence. So I think their fear was sort of mob rule at the ballot box. What we saw was mob rule with, with violence yesterday. And so what protections or guardrails did the founders put in place? Did, you know, the authorities put in place? It, it seemed to people who were looking at the television, like who's responsible? I mean, what, isn't this, isn't this illegal? Well, I mean, so there's a, a lot of different forms of that guardrail. One is separation of powers, right? Sort of the idea that we have to, ha that they were afraid of government first and foremost, right? That p people would exercise power through government in a malicious way. So that was their sort of first fear, um, you know, that government would become like a king or a tyrant. And so the guardrail against that is to separate power, right, between the president, 
you know, Congress and, and the judiciary. So that, that's, that's one guardrail. But the other guardrail, which I think goes back to this common good, if you think of the checks and balances system that they put in place, what they're really doing is, try, is, is making it very hard to act. Right, making it very hard to pass law, very hard for the president to act unilaterally, very hard for the judiciary to do anything without the president or, or Congress. And the reason for that goes back to finding the common good, right? That if ultimately we were restraining everyone and their ability to act, the only way we can do anything is if everyone agrees, right? The only way we can, or nearly everyone. And so, you know, I stayed up longer than I should have. Well, I stayed up a long time last night listening to the debate <laughs> from, from, from the well uh, of the Senate. And as distressing as certain parts of that were, what you do see, again, is that check, right? We're not going to silence speech, even if it's reprehensible or problematic in, in certain respects, um, but we're going to make it really hard for any small faction to exercise power in government. So on one level, as distressing Interesting and disturbing as so many things were yesterday, what we did see was a check that said, like, no matter how, no matter how many, you know, American citizens may support, you know, some sort of further looking into to the election or not certifying it, ultimately, unless you can convince nearly everyone, then we will default back to the voters. And, you know, we could go through lots of different examples, but what I said to my students this morning, more times than they wanted to hear, was restraint restraint, restraint, restraint. That we have a system of government meant to restrain everyone from acting. And we actually prefer non-action to action because the idea is the only way we can act is if we act in the common good together. And that means you gotta have a pretty good idea. You gotta have a pretty good idea if you're gonna get uh, you know, two thirds, three quarters or whatever folks and all three branches of, of government to agree on something. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that I think really, you know, made made people very concerned yesterday is how do we maintain the rule of law, the safety of the Capitol, the safety of our lawmakers, while still preserving our principle of open government? Well, you know, we, we had a shooting and you, you, you probably or, or Sam probably remembers, you know, the, the day, but there was someone, um, I want to say 15, 20 years ago with, a, with an automatic rifle who, who fired on the Capitol grounds. And that changed a lot of protocol, right? When I was a child, you could just, mm -hmm. yeah, so longer than that. Yeah. So when, when I was a child, uh, you know, you could just go visit, you know, like something you see on TV, you just walk in the front door. And so, you know, we've, we've seen restrictions since then. You know, I, I, there is a loss of sort of the mythical uh, America, the sort of mythical open democratic process when those, those new measures went in, but they're necessary. They're necessary for the safety of the process. And I can only imagine that what we're gonna have is, is some more rigorous ones now. I, I would imagine that, uh, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a obviously have no expertise in security whatsoever, but I would imagine that the perimeters uh, should and will be permanently moved further out so that rather than, you know, gaining entrance into the Capitol, basically on its, you know, underneath it at its steps, you, you, you're going to have to go through some sort of checkpoint outside the grounds. That, that's a, that, that, is, that is a sad moment if, if it is the case where we cannot you know, freely and peaceably assemble on, on the grass, you know, below. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's folks that are looking at that now. How far back does the perimeter need to be pushed? Uh, but I would have to defer to them on what's there. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, because we are uh, a constitutional democracy, because the people, and as the senators said last night, that, that, that is the people's house. It is not the senator's house. It is not, you know, the, it is the people's house. They're there to do the people's work. The people will continue uh, to be able to enter that building. They must be able to continue to enter that building. The press will continue to enter that building. We just need to have a little bit more verification, I suppose, before you get um, too close to that building. Well, and other question a lot of people have asked me is, seems as if there was a clear, there was a clear boundary about beyond which people were not permitted to go. And 
an awful lot of people overran that boundary. They knocked down the fences. They were in the Capitol without, you know, they never went through the magnetometers and all the security checks. But there were only about 50 people who were arrested. And several people have said, what happened? Why, why didn't everybody who violated the protocol get arrested? Do you have any insight into that? Well, we'll call my, whether it's insight or speculation, um, and I'll just preface that, uh, and this is not me speaking as a, as a constitutional law professor, but more as a, as a commentator and observer of, of politics and, and, and optics. I got to imagine that there were a number of people who understood that there would be people looking for a fight yesterday. They may not have known the full numbers. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But so, if the civil rights movement taught us anything, it is that the way to defeat evil and, and bullies is, is not to, to respond in kind. Now, generally speaking, police officers, right, they're, they're not there to sort of make civil rights statements. But I, I do wonder the extent to which there was concern, and this is just wondering, the extent to which there was concern that the last thing that you wanted to give the current president of the United States was a picture of bloodied and, and beaten up, um, you know, Trump protesters, because now they're the victim. And obviously that, that was not the right call at the end of the day, but I got to imagine there was some thought of that. It was just really the optics of it. Um, and of course, as a lot of folks pointed out yesterday, if those had been persons of color, you know, um, people would have perceived, a lot of people would have perceived a far more dangerous threat. So I think even if you're concerned about optics, we, sh we should be honest here that um, America tends to be less afraid of white people than it is persons of color. And that maybe they thought that they could uh, patronize, uh, or not patronize, but, but sort of humor this, and they just made a gross miscalculation. Well, you've raised the question about racial justice. And there were several people within the group of uh, insurgents who identified themselves as white supremacists. Um, how did yesterday's drama, you know, how does that fit into the conversation that we're having more broadly about racial justice in this country? Yeah, I, I, I think it is a central part of it, and, I, and I'm glad that you raised it, that most people, uh, you know, as, as, as President-elect Biden said yesterday, th this, this is not America writ large, what we saw yesterday. Most people, I believe, are, are decent, and no matter who they prefer uh, for president would, would never engage in that type of activity. And I think it's important to, to acknowledge that to, because it then begs the question of who exactly are these people, right? And what the Southern Poverty Law Center and you know the FBI itself and, and various others have been showing for uh, you know going back to Oklahoma City bombing and others that we have a lot of domestic terrorists in this country and they they haven't uh, been taken they never get they don't seem at least in, in in the public view to get taken that seriously until something of this sort happens and it, and it surprises the the good regular folks. Um, but, uh, you know, the, these folks are, are positioned and have been positioned across this country. I think it's important to acknowledge that because, you know, there, there is the, the, the mob aspect of it. So if, if you acknowledge that there are violent, racist, anarchists, um, you know, who, who don't care one way about Trump, what they really are, are, are racist sort of folks that want to overthrow, those people, when you get into a mob situation, and, and I was watching yesterday, I said to myself, well, look, we, we've clearly got some incredibly problematic people uh, at the top of the steps. And again, I'm getting outside of my, way outside of my expertise, and I'm novice at this moment. But I said, look, if 
if particularly in this in this electronic age, if the other I don't know how many other tens of thousands of people are uh, um, floating around the streets at that moment in time in Washington D.C., but if if these uh, these militiamen or whatever they are provoke a fight and the and the Capitol Police respond to that, it's probably going to cause a swarm of regular people to approach that space. Now, some regular people go, heck, I'm getting out of here, but there's gawkers, of course, right? And the possibility that the crowd even swells, and then you have this sort of difficulty, like, who is, you know, the, the, the real awful element that needs to be in prison for an extended period of time, and who are gawkers? I mean, that was the amazing thing. The number of people I saw riding on bicycles through the crowd, just sort of observing, I, this was, was strange to me. So in any event, what we do see is a recognition that, that there is some, some highly uh, problematic racism and anarchism and, 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 and ignorance at the front. And the real question, I guess, is you know, how, how far back from the front does that extend? Um, and to what extent are there coalitions between those folks at the front and those at the back? And I think that is one of the conversations we've been ha having about humoring president, you know, people who don't abide by the rule of law or folks at the front. At some point, you humor them enough that you become part of the crowd. And so I, I hope that one good thing that, that could come out of tomorrow is that at least some larger section uh, of America that maybe humored some of these folks realize that they cannot be humored anymore. One of the, if you think about we do have, you know, as a sort of bedrock of our democracy, the right to peaceful protest. So, you know, if the crowd had just simply come to the Capitol, waved signs, um, sang songs, made speeches, even though I personally don't agree with any of their, you know, songs or their speeches, and many others don't, I would protect their right to do that. At what point yesterday did that group move from a peaceful protester to an unlawful activity? Well, I, I didn't watch the blow by blow, but I don't, I don't think I have to, to, to answer your question. So first of all, I'll just agree with you. And I had an op-ed in, in the Hill a couple of weeks ago that said, we have a lot of tough conversations that we have to have. And, and the, the new administration has to be willing to, to, to listen to people that disagree, to have the conversation, have honest conversations. So you're right. And, and that includes in the halls of Congress, that includes on the grounds. But as to your question, at what point did it become unpeaceful? I mean, there are rules and regulations, right, as to where a person can be. And the moment that they step onto ground, uh, either physically, right? They step onto it physically in a place where the Capitol Police rules and regulations say they cannot be. Or even if they haven't entered that space yet, they intend to enter that space and have the intent, right? To, to, to do something, even if legally in a space that would be disruptive. Those are crimes and they have to be fully prosecuted. And that is not a restriction on free speech. As I tell my students every year, um, you have the right to hold any opinion you want to in constitutional law, all right? And in the halls of this law school and any other place. But there are a time, place, and manner. So that does not mean that you have the right to speak when someone else is speaking. I can throw you out of this room if you're speaking when someone else is speaking. That doesn't mean you have the right to interrupt me. It also doesn't mean that anyone else has the right to interrupt you. And so when, when we say that at the moment they step in a place, right, uh, that they're engaging in crime, that's because they have now done something more than just speak their ideas. They are invading a space, and, and that, is, that is a crime. And as I think we also have to sort of parse out, one of my colleagues was asking me about, you know, the levels of crime. I said, you know, amongst those folks, and they're all disparate, uh, I'm sure, um, you know, those who simply meant to stand on a space and were trespassers should be prosecuted as trespassers. Those who in, stepped on a space and continued to move forward with the intent of disrupting Congress engage in a separate crime, right? a much more serious crime. 
if there are electronic communications showing the planning of that in advance, well, then that is a conspiracy to commit that crime, right? And all of these things hopefully will be fully investigated and prosecuted as, as, as it moves forward. And ultimately, you know, things got out of control um, yesterday, but I, I do believe that, um, that we should pursue, just as I described in terms of, of identifying uh, the, the lawbreakers and, and distinguishing the extent to which they should be prosecuted or punished, I should say. Well, do you have an understanding of legally um, what should be the consequences for the people who stepped over the line? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I did not, and I'm not familiar enough with the, with the, with the local ordinances there in, in D.C. And, and the Capitol building to give you a definitive answer. I would simply say there is trespassing, which is regardless of your, regardless of whether you wanted to disrupt or not, right? If you step into a place that you're not authorized to be, that is trespassing, right? Um, whether DC treats that as criminal trespass or misdemeanor trespass, I can't answer that. When you trespass with the intent to disrupt, that's a far more serious crime. Again, I haven't looked at, at, at the laws there, but I would imagine that could move into a felony if not a quite serious felony. If you not only intend to disrupt, but intend to take action that puts other human beings' lives at risk, well, then now we begin to get into a situation of reckless endangerment of life. And of course, there was injury and property. So, you know, we have a, a, a scale. And I think as we sort of look through that, some of those are extremely serious. Trespassing plus intent to disrupt plus uh, reckless endangerment or intentional endangerment or intentional uh, violence towards others. Those are very, very, very serious crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our uh, listeners are asking questions about, is there an assess assessment? And the answer, we don't have yet a full assessment of the damage that was done. Um, the, initial the initial reports are interesting in some ways in that the invaders who went into the Capitol did not appear to go to destroy the Capitol. Unlike, you know, the last time there was a malicious group that went to take over the Capitol was the British in 1814 during the War of 1812. Um, and they went in and burned and attempted to burn the whole thing down. But this group was more, they went in to take it over. It was more of a coup than an attack. They did things like went into Nancy Pelosi's office and sat at her desk and put feet on her desk in a way that sort of was very um, antagonistic toward her, took a couple pieces of her stationery, um, took some pictures, hurt some pictures in her office went to the uh, Senate and went into the well of the Senate where no one is to go except the elected senators, stood at the presiding desk and announced that Trump was president. All of which in some ways sort of reinforced the fact that even the invaders perceived the Capitol as the temple of democracy and that if they could take it over and be in charge of the capital they could you know run the government and that gets us to the education question where you know which is where your area of expertise started um, when the founders talked about having an educated citizenry they weren't talking about just making sure that the members of congress and the lawmakers were educated. They talked about having a citizenry who were educated about how the government was intended to work, that we would teach people how to read so that our citizens could make decisions for themselves. Given the fact that we had, in essence, a mob taking over the Capitol, many of whom believed, honestly believed that if they could stop the action of the Congress in certifying the electoral reports that they could stop 
Joe Biden from becoming president. How does that speak to the need for civic education? Yeah, let me first, hopefully not, and I'm not dodging your question, but you, you, you began with this point of the sort of overtaking and, and occupying the seat of democracy. And, and I want to respond to that before we get to the education part, because the Constitution also does speak to, to treason and it requires witnesses. So there, it is that one crime in particular that the Constitution speaks to. And as you articulated, right, occupying the seat of power, or as I described it earlier, uh, occupying territory on, on uh, it was, it was ta had taken territory on the steps. I mean, that was the clearest, the sort of vision of the steps of the Capitol had been taken and it was owned or run by someone else, at least for a moment in time. No matter what those individuals think or thought they were doing, no matter how valiant they may have perceived themselves, we are a rule of law. We have a democratic a society run by a constitution. No man, no voter, group of voters is above that. And regardless of your fantastical or misled or misinformed, whatever the reasons are, when you take action to set yourself in a seat of government and take over the people's house in that way, it strikes me as, as you called it a coup attempt. That, that is treason. Now, I will say right now, I am not in favor of the death penalty. I'm not getting into that. I just simply say that the, the Constitution, though, sees that as such a serious thing that it speaks of treason right, as being a thing for which one could be executed for. So our Constitution, at least in that phrase, um, sees that type of activity as being the most serious defined you know, threat, sort of treasonous activity to our democracy. And again, the intentions don't matter. The rule of law dictates uh, how our system is to be run. And if, if you want to do something else, then, then you are overthrowing government in a treasonous manner. As your question about um, educated citizenry, I mean, yes, this, this has been, to, to bring it down a notch, uh, you know, this, this has been a conversation that, that folks that do civics education, and I know you guys work, work on it as well, have been sort of cataloging uh, for, uh, with a lot of sort of concern for the past decade or so of how ignorant, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way, but it's sort of how ignorant and unknowledgeable the average citizen is about our constitutional system. That, and I don't have the percentages in front of me, but it's an alarming percentage that can't, I think it's over 50% that can't name, if asked, you know, can't name the three branches of government, right? So that's a serious problem. There's also in the data an increasing, um, increasing sympathy to uh, autocratic rule. And I think you, you, you see that in, in a lot of these sort of racist and other elements that, that we saw yesterday, that they actually do not believe a lot of folks respond that they, you know, if they're put free speech up against some other value, they pick other values, right? Um, and so, and the will of the majority. So what we do have, troublingly, uh, is less acceptance of democratic values and an understanding of how our government works. And that, that's, that's a big problem. As I was telling my students this morning, our constitution is but a piece of paper with words that we can read. And the question we must ask ourselves is what is the glue that has held those basic words together for over 200 years? The words themselves are not executing, right? They don't give us all the answers to all these problems. And I said the glue is our willingness to accede to these ideas. And so ultimately what we see is that if we do not provide sufficient civics education, I'm adherence to the rule of law, common values, then we begin to lose the glue that holds our constitutional democracy together. And again, that, that's, that's what we began this conversation with, was the founders saying, we have to have an education system that helps people find the common good, right? Um, which is that glue, right? That we're all in this together. And, you know, I'll cut it short so we can get to the next question, but there have been a number of principles, even in the, in the U.S. Senate that I've sort of written about uh, in popular media as well, that the Senate itself has adopted, whether we like it or not, filibusters, the pink slip, right, for the, for the 
uh, for the judge from, from your home state. All of those were about exercising restraint to find common agreement. And to give the clearest example, right, Jesse Helms himself, Right? kept North Carolinians and African Americans off the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, for decades for unjust reasons. But that Senate right, understood that adhering to a common set of rules under which all persons, regardless of motive, would, would adhere to them was important. So they kept the pink slip, but to say, you know what, if Helms wants to keep objecting, then he can. At the same token, so can Paul Wellstone. He can object for any reason he wants. And if we can all object, right, for any reason, that's a good thing. And by the same, Strom Thurmond from the state of South Carolina filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 1964 for an extended period of time. No one could say that his substantive motivations were good. But when we do away with these restraints, right, we then to get, begin to descend into anarchy. We descend into might makes right. And so, you know, a lot, a lot of Democrats probably don't want to hear it, but when you see this type of activity, you, you, you have to say, look, things like the filibuster, things like the pink slip, these are here to protect us from our worst instincts. And we've been tearing, we've been tearing these practices down uh, for, for a while and descending into very dark places like we saw yesterday. We have many, many questions about the actual security protocol that was in place and who's in charge with the Capitol Police and the federal, uh, you know, National Guard, the relationship between DC and the federal government. And I'm not gonna put those to you because I know that there's gonna be a quite a significant inquiry here because there's a, a great deal of thought on the part of many that something went fundamentally wrong. The, the security perimeter was not strong. Um, there are some who maintain that, you know, had the District of Columbia been a state and able to have brought up the National Guard on its own without federal, you know, authorization, that the National Guard could have been there at the beginning and maybe the Capitol wouldn't have been breached. We don't know that. Um, we do know that it took a while for the guard to get brought up because it did take federal uh, federal action. Ultimately, the vice president authorized it. Initially, we had a time where the Virginia and Maryland were sending in federal guard. That was after the action began. So I'm not recognizing that many of you have questions about that. And once there is a significant inquiry and we begin to have a results we'll have a seminar about you know what we found and what we learned, but I'm not gonna to try to have Professor Black opine on something that he doesn't really have the, the facts about. But if you look at what you do, I think have some understanding about is, are there any historical parallels uh, to what happened yesterday from your knowledge? Yeah, well, you know, obviously, you, you mentioned 1814. Um, you know, one thing that, that I've written about in my book and then, and then thought about is, is how the divisions of race, which we, which we mentioned earlier, the divisions of power, cause people uh, to engage in such behavior, and not just regular folks. I mean, the, as, as many of the, the viewers probably know, um, Senator Charles Sumner was caned and beaten inside the United States Capitol uh, by the congressman from the state of South Carolina because of the views that Senator Sumter, uh, Sumner held regarding abolition. And of course, that led us to, to civil war. It led us through the dark challenges after the Reconstruction as well. And I cite that not as a analog to the the violence that we saw yesterday, but the sort of the cultural strife, the idea that we would resort to violence to solve our differences as opposed to to debating and, and talking them out. And, and that that's a corrosive, corrosive thing. Um, and, and of course, we, we, we saw that then. We saw it. We see it now. The other parallel that I'll make, and I think this is an important one. We haven't talked about 
social media uh, and sort of information that we've talked generally about uh, an educated citizenry. And I gave a, a TED talk a year or so ago about how many parallels there are between today and the late 1800s. Then in the late 1800s, there was more newspapers in circulation than at any other time in American history. Those newspapers in many respects resembled the blogs and the Twitter feeds of today. Everyone had one, right? Every political party had its own newspaper at the state, local level. You had people in towns that just sort of started their own papers. That's why they were called the penny presses, right? They were cheap and you could circulate them. And there was a lot of nonsense in them, right? There was a lot of scandal and intrigue in them. The president himself also had what they called the president's organ. There was a newspaper, and I was looking at some of the details for that talk, that apparently even the federal government, probably illegitimately, was subsidizing the president's organ, his outside newspaper. But the point of that is, and also sort of taking into account that we lived in a frontier world at that point, right? So your ability to understand what was happening in the halls of Congress, if you lived in Kansas, or for that matter, if you lived across the river in Virginia, was to be able to read the newspaper, but not one newspaper, right? But to be able to sort through the penny presses, right? And decipher the truth, right? Fact from fiction. And I'm sure a lot of people got that wrong. But the point that I'm making is that literacy was key to understanding the power and actions of government in the late 1800s. And really the only difference, well, that's an overstatement. The major difference today is not that we have Twitter and blogs and this sort of thing. The major difference is that it's electronic. I think we have a far less diligent set of individuals engaging that information quite often. And maybe we have more presses than the penny presses we often do. But the problem is still the same. The problem is still the same. How can we educate, or I should say our charge is to educate children to decipher that information? to educate adults. And I'll tell you, having looked at it, that quote unquote fake news and facts are very, very hard for children to spot. They're very, very hard for some, well, uneducated folks to spot and sometimes even for educated folks to spot. So we are in a world now that we obviously need civics, we need to understand our government, but we're also in a world in which we need to be training the skills to filter information, right? To filter the knowledge. And so our education system is going to have to adjust to that. Because if it doesn't, there is no seminar such as this that will generate enough people. There is no fair politician, I think, that's gonna, we could all just sort of trust to lead the way for us, that ultimately we lack the capacity to move forward unless individual citizens have the understanding and maturity to filter disparate and conflicting information. Our the future of our constitutional democracy rests upon that skill. The only other option would be, it's not an option, to throw away all of our cell phones, right? To, to sort of ban information. We're not going to do that. We're America, right? We're not going to have, right, Congress saying what's okay to read on the internet or not. We're not going to have Congress dictating how many hours a day we can spend on Twitter. The only check against those problems is the education of our children. And so let us, you know, focus on education for a moment, uh, because that is really a foundation. And being able to teach Americans of all ages how to evaluate information that is presented in all manner and sorts. Um, we have social media, we have you know, random things. We have the traditional media. We have elected officials. Is there, is there any responsibility for elected officials to tell the truth? Yeah, there, there, there is. There, there certainly is. Um, and one of the, one of the things that, that occurred to me in the last day or so, I don't want to get on an anti. Twitter rant, I, you know, I spend my fair amount of time on there trying to communicate, but um, that everyone wants to be a media superstar, right? That, you know, to be wanted, right? We sort of measure ourselves 
not all of us, I mean, measure themselves in Facebook friends and Twitter followers and retweeters. And so what we have is a, a actually sort of a, a, I don't mean to turn into the scientist, which I'm not an expert into either, but we have a sort of changing in the way that we run our, what, what makes us feel good, those sort of stimulation points in our mind, right? And we have politicians who seem to be more interested in being loved either on Twitter or, you know, at the ballot box, whatever it may be, than telling the truth. You're right. We have to begin to tell the truth. And, and that's the, you know, I'll leave it to the, to, the, to the psychologist, but that's the other danger point that we're in is that, um, you know, number one, that, that the mind is, get, is addicted, right, to, to bad information. And number two, and this is the important one, and this is a psychological process, or confirmation bias, right, that, that we, our brains are hardwired to assimilate and take in information that is consistent with our own biases and to reject information that is inconsistent with our own biases. So it's not just stupidity, it is sort of a way our brain functions. And people who overcome that are people who are well-educated and very thoughtful. It is not an easy thing to do. Um, and I, I don't want to, to, to suggest otherwise, but that, that is the place that we're in. Because as you said earlier, some, some of these folks that, that, you know, engage in insurrection yesterday somehow or another thought that they were upholding democracy, right? Strange idea to the rest of us, but, you know, they had filtered enough information and in through their own biases that that was the reality I, I, for some of them, right? For some of them. Which is the point that brings us back to education. One couple, couple of, you know, sort of lightning round things. Um, when you refer to the pink slip, um, talking about judges, uh, actually around here it's referred to as blue slip. Uh, blue, uh, sorry. And so you know, just you know, just so that nobody goes back and says, "Well, wait a minute, what was he talking about?" Pink yeah. slip. We have blue slips here. Blue so uh, that and. We have many questions, and let's maybe see what you can do with this, is about the role of the current president. Um, and there are many people who are concerned that he provided some encouragement to the invaders. Um, he continues to uh, act as if there is a way to undo the election and states it with such authority and is the president. Um, are, there, um, are there ways to manage that? Um, what would you suspect, um, you know, what would you offer as mechanisms that are available to deal with the situation we have at hand? Well, you know, plenty of folks have, have talked about the ability to remove uh, a president who is unable to discharge his or her duties. Um, you know, that requires the action of, of his cabinet. I don't see that happening. I think, you know, um, that, that is a mechanism that, it, that is available. I, I don't have all the information, but, but the idea or the sort of the reports, whether they're true or not, and I'm always careful about that, but that, that effectively Vice President Pence had, was running the government yesterday, or at least maybe had been running it for quite some time because the president has, isn't actually interested in, in doing so. That's actually a, a, a <laughs> both scary and not scary. Uh, scary insofar as um, we can't have a system in which the person who's not the president is exercising the powers of the president. Um, so if those reports have some inkling of truth, it, it does beg the question, right? We only have one president and it's not Michael Pence. And if he's exercising those powers, then he needs to be doing it validly, not invalidly. I'll just leave it at, at that. I, I don't think that that's going to happen as much as maybe some folks would want it to. You know, as to the sort of incitement which you, you raised, you know, and there are free speech, you know, protections for, for, for regular folks. And of course the president has powers as well. And he has immunities, um, you know, incitement of a riot re requires 
some pretty specific and, and, and detailed sort of information. And the point of that, uh, notwithstanding the, the horribleness of yesterday, is to, to protect, you know, free and unfettered free speech. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, to claim that the, I mean, I, I think the president is, is, is terrible on 125 ways in terms of the way he's conducted himself. Um, you know, ha has he violated the law? I, I, I struggle to say that he's violated those sort of incitement of a right, and even if, he's, even if he has, he's probably got presidential immunity for it, to be quite honest. So we really are kind of in, in a pickle at, at the moment. I'll give one quick comment, which I know we're supposed to be in the, in the lightning round, and this is really for the next administration. I see comments popping up there. That one of the ways that we heal ourselves is to extend olive branches. And the only way, the only olive branches that are meaningful are from individuals who are in positions of power. Right? When, you, when you're not in power, you, you can't extend one. You have to have leverage. And I have, you know, we've got lots of stuff to do with COVID and other things to deal with. I do think it is important for President Biden uh, to think about, is there legislation that is constitutional that constrains the president's power, his own power? It would be incredibly symbolic as a matter of rule of law, after having seen the way the current occupant has acted, for the next one to say, you know what, I currently have this power, Congress has ceded it to me or there's some gray, gray area, but I see the danger of our democracy of having men and women act in this fashion. I am calling on Congress to pass legislation to curtail certain presidential powers within the scope of the Constitution is permissible. And I don't mean this as a way that we need to ham string Joe Biden. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have to understand that the danger that lies in that office and its effectiveness and in its ineffectiveness, which we have, have been seeing. So let's talk another about the president. Two things. Um, one is there's a lot of conversation about the 25th Amendment. And just so that everyone is clear, the 25th Amendment was passed um, in order to create a mechanism for the vice president to convene the cabinet and have a majority of the cabinet determine that the current president is at the moment unable to act, um, came, you know, in the context of uh, presidents being shot, being in, in medical care issues. One of the questions that has been raised that I honestly don't know the answer to, and I don't know if you do either, is we have an awful lot of acting cabinet members. Um, if there was to be any action on the 25th Amendment, would an acting cabinet member have the authority to do that? Um, um, that's, that's an excellent question. I don't know the exact answer to. I, I would venture to say that because the president, this is now we're getting into sort of structural constitutional, right? but since the president himself has delegated that authority, right? he's the only one that can choose. So even with an acting cabinet, right, it is the president who, who has, has delegated that authority. And what the 25th Amendment is doing is creating an action within the executive department to change its leadership, right? And so if the president has validly delegated authority, um, then my instinct is to say that it should be appropriate because the, 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 because the only thing that really separates the acting from the full is whether Congress or I say the Senate also thinks this person is good for the job, the cabinet member. But it strikes me that in the question of the 25th Amendment, it doesn't really matter whether um, the Senate likes this person. Right? The Senate's role is to keep people that the president wants and they don't. So it seems to me, structurally speaking, there's no problem for the people that the president wants, regardless of whether the Senate does or not, to be part of that conversation. That is my off the hip, um, you know, sort of reaction to that question. And one other question about that. Uh, do you think the Constitution allows the president to pardon himself? I do not. I do not. I have never understood that line of thinking, um, if, if we go back to, to Marbury versus 
Madison uh, sort of foundational constitutional law case about judicial review. And, and the issue there is the rule of law and that no man or woman is above it. And they sort of go through the mechanisms of dealing with, with Marbury versus Madison to explain that, you know, the, the president is, is not above the law. And if we put him above the law, then we cease to be a constitutional democracy. So on, on, on that, on that metric, I, I don't, I don't understand, and maybe someone has it, but I do not countenance or understand a rationale by which the president could put himself above the law. When the president pardons someone else, that's him discharging his duty. He's not putting himself above the law. Um, now, you know, the simple quote unquote solution is that, you know, he resigns at 11 o'clock and then Mike Pence, you know, pardons him. And that's what folks have talked about. Um, so anyway, but I, I do not believe that the president can validly pardon pardon himself. And what would you suggest that Congress do in order to ensure that what happened yesterday doesn't happen again while still preserving civil rights, civil liberty, right to protest, right to petition your government? Uh, well, I mean, look, we, we so you, you were, were, were putting the right to protest and petition and tension with, you know, uh, safety and sanctity of the grounds. So how do we balance those? You know, the more safe we make it, the less, you know, free and open speech there is. At the very same time, right, there is a park permitting process that's been on the, the mall, and I, I don't know what the process is for the Capitol grounds, where, you know, some people get to camp for a certain amount of days, but not longer. I mean, we have mechanisms um, that, you know, limit access. But I think we could all agree that, uh, you know, the, the, the United States Mall remains open for, for protest and advocacy. And I think that a set of rules that, um, you know, require more verification before you have uh, X number of people gather together um, is is permissible. We, we do have to be careful, right? I mean, a lot of college campuses have been struggling with this same issue, um, that if the effect of the permitting process is to deny people sort of certain spontaneity and free speech, that can be a problem. So our, 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 maybe the answer to this, now that you, you raise it and I think thought out loud, is that Congress might actually look to what some of our college campuses have been struggling with because th this, this firestorm actually came to our college campuses over the last couple of years, which have always been completely open. And then we've had violence and, you know, the University of Florida, for instance, I forget who the speaker was that was coming there. It was going to be like half a million dollars for them to host this one speaker. And so our universities have been working through this. And I imagine that um, obviously the capital is different than our universities. There's lessons to be learned from our universities in terms of the, how, how they're dealing with ensuring free speech on college campus, but also the safety um, of the students who are there. Um, and I want to read something. Um, we are going to have another, uh, another session with you where we're going to talk specifically about education and in the light of the constitution what what does uh what are what is a constitutional right to education is there a constitutional right um and so on tuesday that was what we were originally going to talk about with you today so on tuesday i was reading you know parts of your book to get prepared for a conversation different than the one that we just had because we had to, you know, change to the moment. But I want to share with you a piece that, share with the readers, you, you know because you wrote it, uh, a piece that you wrote just to understand why education and civic education is so important to make our democracy work. Um, you write in, in your book, the nation's very concept of government is premised on an educated citizenry. From its infancy, the United States has sought to distinguish itself with education. More particularly, education has been the tool through which our nation 
has sought to perfect its democratic ideals. That, and not our failures, is the real lesson to take from our history. Democracy, citizenship, and education ultimately move hand in hand, whether their goals are good or bad. So education policy is never really just about education. The stakes are always much higher. Now, can you imagine on Tuesday, I thought that would be the foundation for our conversation. And it is the foundation for our conversation, but it is more clear now than ever before. So my final question for you is, what do the events of yesterday tell us or not tell us about the strengths of our constitutional system or its weak spots? Yeah, yeah. what it tells us is that we have a structure in place with, with rules and processes and that men and women who are committed to those can reconvene at eight o'clock last night and go through the night to certify Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as president and vice president. Right? So we have processes that can withstand this. But what it also demonstrates is that ultimately for those processes to work, which has always been the case, for those processes to work, we have to have people of good faith. Those constitutional ideas are not self-executing. Right? And we have to have leaders who are willing to put good faith, right, execution of those laws above trying to exploit gray areas. Because the other side of it is, is there are plenty of gray areas in the Constitution. And when people lose the commitment to good faith, that thing begins to crumble. It begins to crumble. And again, I don't want to make this a diatribe on, on, on President Trump's policies over the last four years. But what we can see is that an individual who, laxed, who lacked the good faith to abide by that democracy and that document could do a lot of stuff we never imagined. And what we also saw was that a Senate who was unwilling to exercise the good faith, to exercise its independent role as a co-equal branch, to stop that exercise of good faith, could allow it to run unfettered. And so ultimately, right, in both the Senate and the presidency for our constitutional democracy to work. We have to have people of good faith. And, and, and let me make this final comment, which is maybe one I shouldn't make, when, but I will. <laughs> when, when, President Don, when Donald Trump was running for the presidency and he was saying and doing many of the same things that, that he does now, I was not worried. I was not worried. I said to a colleague, Americans do not put a man or woman's finger on the button who lacks a certain amount of normative sanity, sort of normative behavior, that we don't put reckless people's fingers on the button, right? That for, you know, Jane, your generation, I remember being a child putting my head between my knees and um, practicing, you know, uh, nuclear bomb drills as a school right. child. I remember that. We, my generation, I thought, did not put people's fingers on the buttons. And, and I got proved wrong that America, for whatever reason, and I say that to say not agree or disagree with Donald Trump's policy, but as a matter of temperament, that no regular American would vote for someone whose temperament was problematic. And that is gone. We've seen that gone. I hope, if anything good comes from that yesterday is that Americans will remember that temperament and character matter more than policy. When that building was assaulted, it was an assault on every single law that Republicans passed, every single law that Democrats have passed for the history of this country. It is ultimately right about, um, about temperament and character and not about winning or losing on a piece of legislation. So, 
I hope those, the, those folks understand how dangerous it is to put someone's finger on the button who doesn't share the character and temperament of, of regular good people in America. Well, Professor Black, you are fascinating and you've been wonderful to quickly pivot like you did. Thank you very much. We will um, have rescheduled, so watch, watch the news um, and we'll tell you when we're going to have uh, Professor Black talk about his book. I want you to be aware that upcoming uh, on next Tuesday, on January 12th, we're going to talk about the behind the scenes activity of presidential inaugurations. There's no question that this year's presidential inauguration was always going to be different because of the pandemic and because of COVID and because of the need to social distance and be, be safe. Now safety has a new, uh, a new mechanism. And so our inauguration this January 20th, 2021, will be completely different. But we have two folks um, who have worked behind the scenes as key staffers on presidential inaugurations who will talk about what, what goes on behind the scenes and they will also be able to give us a little bit of perspective how those decisions get made as the decisions are gonna be made even now. I know the presidential inaugural committee is trying to figure out what we will do because the one thing you saw from our Congress was an absolute determination that the government and the work of democracy would be done. Albeit they did it till three o'clock in the morning, but they got it done. And I am confident that we will inaugurate a president, our new president, President Joe, President-elect Joe Biden on January 20th, 2021. What form that will take, we don't know but we'll have an interesting conversation on the 12th. Thank you. We always remind you, these seminars are available only because of the members, donors, and supporters of the Capitol Historical Society. We really appreciate your help and support. And if anything we learn, it is that the work we do to educate about the Capitol, about Congress, and about our government is more important than ever. And I really appreciate somebody who just wrote in and said, their ornament made from Capital Market marble has become even more precious. If you look over the back of my shoulder, you see bookends made from marble from the Capitol. And that's one of the ways we support ourselves. So we're happy for you to buy merchandise. When Sam kicked it off, he had a tie from our collection, which was the Constitution. And so. We thank you all for being with us. Thank you for your attention. We're sorry we went a few minutes over, but it was a worthy conversation. Be well. We look forward to seeing you on the 12th. Thank you very much, Professor Black. Thank you.